Hey, there we go. Serverside development and rock and roll. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh. Morning, everyone. Hi, guys. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. My turn to talk now. Okay. Time for software. Can you hear me? I'm going to start. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm, I'm all from Wix. I, I assume most of you have heard about Wix, but just to give you a very quick recap of what we're doing. What we're doing is building websites, and for some reason, I don't see the video here, which doesn't really matter, but we'll just go forward. Uh, come on. Okay, and we're doing that in an online tool to, that actually uh, allows in the browser to go and create a website using drag and drop technology, uh, which is today seems like trivial, but in 2006 when we started that was like, no one does that, has done that. Today, after almost 10 years, we're over 80 million users, we uh, have lots, we have big numbers everywhere, but I think the number that interests us today is the fact that we have over 200 microservices working for Wix. So, you know, company, over 1,000 people, almost 400 developers, 200 microservices. I have no idea how many instances. I assume it's something in the order of 1,000, over 1,000 instances running. There's a lot going on there. And we can, I can go on and talk about microservices and about a lot of different aspects of how to do microservices. And you know, there's things like clustering and DevOps and continuous delivery and how do you build it, what is the right technology stack and how two different microservices should talk with one another, should we use console or should we use something different and so on. And there's a lot of talks about, a lot of information online about how to do microservices. But then, I can struck me that there isn't a lot of talks about why. So I can start asking myself, why do we need microservices? Why is that the right thing to do? And let's, let me be honest, when we started Wix, we started with one monolith. We had one server, MySQL, Java, that's it. And it, we evolved into a microservices ecosystem. It wasn't a decision, there wasn't anyone there wasn't any, kind, any chief architect at the time, but it was anyone that actually went to the company and says, our decision is to go to microservices architecture. After we had tens of microservices, we kind of figured out, oh, that's microservice, nice. So what's, what's the game? Why, why, why is it an interesting thing? And I'm going to claim that microservices are interesting once you go and start scaling things up. And I mean, when I'm talking about scaling, I'm talking about scaling people, first of all, and then scaling software, going up with number of instances, going up with number with your amount of data, and so on. And two of the main reasons why are SLA and risk. And I know it might sound a bit vague at the moment, so let me start and explain. So what's risk? Risk in software. The Three main causes for risk. For risk basically is the chance that when you're doing something or when you're not doing anything, your software or your product will fail and will someone need to go to wake up and start fixing stuff. And there's different reasons for that. One reason is you might have failures, hardware failures or third party failures. And we had all kinds of wacky stuff like a UPS that died and dropped down a data center. And two months later, after that, that problem was fixed and we tried to check that we have our DRP in place working, we stopped the UPS and the data center again went down and Wix went down again. And half a year after that, all the disks in the data center decided to suicide because of a malfunction at the same time. So we kind of lost all the disks in the data center. Anyway, those things happen. This is the real world. And this is one cause of risk. And a lot of it is something that we can't really mitigate. It's there, but we just need to, to live with that. Another thing is attacks, DDoS. Wix is currently under almost 
almost we get an attack, some kind of attack every day. The most funniest attack we got was someone sending us a note, pay us $50 or we're going to attack you. And that was the worst attack we ever got. We should have paid us $50 probably. But then there is actually a third cause for risk and that's change. Some developer changes something, deploys that, or some ops change some configuration, pushes that online, and that causes a problem. And there's a lot of who can go and talk about change and why DevOps tries to mitigate the risk from change, but we're talking about microservices and why you want microservices. So let's first of all go and look at what happens without microservices. So this this is how the, looked, the world looked like before microservices. We had one service, one application, one process, it did it all. And this one process had a lot of contributors to help build it. So we, had, we have different kinds of teams. We have people that like to use the blue programming language and user, the people who like to use the green programming language or Paradigm and the people who like on third group of people and then we have different products and different UX and different functions and all of them at the end create one deployable process which means we need to sync between everyone to make sure they're ready at the same time that the code is done at the same time so we need to add some kind of project management that goes across all the teams. And remember, I, I have today we have 400 developers. It's start to get a bit of a mess to organize all of this stuff. And then what happens if that team on the right over there is done, but at the same time that team on the left here is not? So we can send the team on the right for vacation for a few days. But then the team down there figures that in their code there is a critical bug that has to be pushed to production now. So how do we compile this thing and create something sensible? How do we check it? When you give that, when you package this thing, we give it to QA, what do we give, what do you tell the QA to check? Check everything? Basically what happens here is that any change that anyone does in any of the teams causes risk to, for everyone else. And it might be that that person on that team on the right has a very good idea that caused the memory leak or to have taken too much CPU, which caused the purgation of service for everyone else. It might be that the product manager on the right has no idea that the product manager on the left is relying on some feature and changes that feature. And then the product manager on the left, the thing that he built, breaks up on production. So all of those are problems that we've seen with uh, monolithic architectures which is kind of why, one of the reasons why you go to microservices. And in microservices, we just break it up. A team has one or more microservices, and we're trying to make them as independent as we can. And how, how basically what happens? The thing that really happens it, is that with microservices, we don't really talk about it because we don't like to talk about processes, about you know, OS level processes. But at the end, the microservice is an independent process. It might be Docker, wrapped, it might, be not, it might not be, but being a process means that it has separate resources. We decoupled memory, CPU, all of the network buffers, a lot of the stuff we've decoupled. It's not really to decouple everything because you might collocate a few of those microservices on the, on the same machine. So we might use Docker to separate to some degree, or we might use VMs to separate a little bit better, but at the end you can Always there's some kind of a limited amount of risk because of collocation, but we still solved a lot of the risk. And then we decouple the code. We can compile at separate times and deploy at separate times different parts of the system. A change that one team does doesn't have to be packaged with another team. Doesn't even have to be synced with another team as long as we just keep the interface between them. Which means we decouple deployment. So we can deploy when something is done in as much as you want. The only thing that we haven't solved is the risk by a team changing the interface or the data that goes over the interface that another team is using, which is basically we need to keep com compatibility between the different services. But that's something we can actually know. That's something that we can comprehend. It's a model we understand. 
We understand services, we understand compatibility, well, kind of. It's always, every developer has at least one failure in keeping backward compatibility between services, especially forward compatibility, but at least it's something we can work with. So that's better. We scope the risk. So the risk now is that the team can mess up a service. And if we're doing gradual deployments or we're doing kind, any kind of traffic splitting or smart deployment strategies, we can even mitigate that. There is a, there's a claim that with microservices, you can agree with that, you might not agree with that, that's totally fine, but there is a claim that with microservices, you don't need any guard. You can check your creation on production. Just deploy, your, you might have you know, five instances running, deploy another instance of the new version without any check, no tests, nothing. Deploy it on production, send to it 1% of the traffic, look what happens. If it generates a problem, sure, you kind of messed up 1% of your traffic. You, in most cases, you can actually work with that. I'm not saying that is the right way to do it. I'm not saying that's the wrong way to do it. I guess it depends on the business and what we're really doing. But that's something that we can do with a monolith. That's coping off the risk. But then we have to ask ourselves the following question. So why does a team need multiple microservices? Why not have a monolith for a team? Basically, no. I've talked just about separating the risk between different teams. And the reason for it is because a team is kind of a scope of a knowledge between people. Pe one people in a team is more likely to know what other people in his team are doing than other people. And because we want to have redundancy between people and so on. And we have independent release cycles. And we have scoped the risk to the team. We give them responsibility for what they're doing. So why do we need more than one microservice? And here comes SLA. Now, it's really important. I think it's important to say about SLA is when we talk about SLA, we're not talking about SLA. SLA is basically an agreement. It's a contract. It's a legal document. And we're not really talking about a legal document. We're talking about the service level. But try as much as I, try as I can. I could not get developers to not say SLA. So if we call it SLA, then it's SLA. But what we, really, what we mean here is what are, the really, what are the requirements of each of the parts in terms of the service that they should provide our system? And we can look at different aspects of, of that. Do we need to deploy a certain part on multiple clouds, or just on one cloud, or multiple zones? Do we need a speci specific solution for availability or for scaling? Is the scaling strategy different? Is the deployment structure different? Maybe we need to have different runtimes, different programming languages. All of those reasons are reasons why we would break and create multiple microservices within one team. And you know, for instance, we have a case where uh, we have a service that has a specific database, which is a very large MySQL database. And that service relies on it to get very low latency. We get to a latency of 0.4 milliseconds with MySQL, which is kind of kind of cool with MySQL. But that means that that MySQL instance is dedicated for that service. No one else is allowed to use it, which is another reason why you break stuff up. And just to give an example of this team with A, B, C, D over there, we might find that, that for that team, what they actually have are four different services that one of them needs to be very highly available and work on multiple cloud environments with lots of instances, a lot of stuff between them. The second one might, do, might be a decision to create a failover on a different stack, different technology stack. And I kind of know a company that's doing the something like that, and that's actually us. Our main service, the one that actually uh, sends out the HTML pages, that actually is doing Wix, the public part, the part that needs to have the highest SLA, that runs on two data centers of our own, and then on two clouds, 
and is using a two different storage engines and I think it's one, it depends on which part of it, if it's one or two technology stacks. So that system by itself, although it's a single logical system, it has two different, or maybe even actually more than two microservices involved in that. And some of them are actually doing the same thing, just in different environments. But then we might have some kind of a back office. You know, just kind of a tool that developers use to manage their something, or their content, or some a tool for our support, to decide and say, oh, this site, we don't like it. It's infringing someone's rights. Let's block it. Or this site is, used, is being used to do something malicious. Let's block that other site. And this site, well, the user called needs some help. Let's go and help him with some parameter, like connecting the domain. Such an application doesn't need to have the same service level guarantees as our main application. And it might be the same team is doing it, because that makes sense, but it, it's not the same. It does have the same requirements and same needs. It doesn't make sense to package them together. Also, it doesn't really have the same release cycle. And last, we might have, you know, anything else, basically. So those are reasons why we want to break microservices more and more. But then comes the question that always here, so what's the right size for a microservice? Does anyone know how to answer that question? What is the right size for a microservice? It can be anything. Well, if you followed what I what I tried to say up till now, I, I actually give have given two ideas. One is by the size of the team, you scope a microservice to a team, and then second one is by the SLA, which really that does give you a size in terms of you know number of classes or number of or amount of code or amount of memory. It's just heuristic. But then we do, sh we do need to ask the question, should it go smaller? There's discussion about why not package each class as a microservice? Or why not package each package as a microservice? And is a, our date generator micro a microservice? I, that service that gives us the date, should that be a microservice? You know, that's always a very good example. The reason why it should be a microservice, because then we'll ensure that everything in our system will get the same date. Otherwise, we rely on the, on the operating system. When you rely on the operating system, I was working in a company that, does, that has done performance monitoring for network. And we measured on each of uh, the nodes the amount of bytes it sends out and the amount of bytes it gets on the other side. And we started, you know, and in, then we're looking at the diff to know how many packets were lost. And you start getting positive numbers for lost packets. You know, you get results that the network invented packets. And that happened because the clock on different machines wasn't synchronized. So there's sometimes very good reasons why you do want to have a clock service. You know, but is that a really microservice that you want to have? So let's try and figure out that problem. You know, we can size a microservice from any size, from a full cluster all the way down to an Arduino. I was actually thinking about maybe it makes sense to create an architecture which each microservice run on, an Ar on a physical Arduino. Maybe. Anyway, there is a trade-off. And that's, that's the thing that we should keep in mind when we talk about microservices. And so we talked about reducing the risk, and we talked about SLA, we talked about all kinds of stuff. But what, where do we pay? So we pay by a few things. Well, the first thing, the more microservices we have, we, the more network ops we're going to have. Network op means latency. Every network op would, would give you roughly one millisecond delay. If you have 200 microservices, that's 200 mic microseconds without doing anything. 200, micro 200 microseconds is a measure, is a time that you actually can see that you can feel in your eyes. You can, when you look at system, you can see that. And remember that on top of that, when you communicate from, let's say, the Middle East to the US, you have 200 microseconds 
network latency, just to get DNS. You have another 200, 200 just to get your DNS resolved. And on top of that, you're going to add another 200 just because you have 200 microservices. Probably not a good idea. But then that is not the worst. The worst is the fact that every network op introduces a certain percentage of failures. And those percentages of failures grow exponentially with the number of ops that you have. So before you know that, you're going to degrade your availability and you're going to degrade your service in a very, in, in a very intense way. The next problem we're going to face is, so you know, when you add two microservices, it's very easy to explain how the system works. You get a request here, it goes there, and gets back. That's it. When you have 20, the request goes here, and then it goes somewhere. When you have 200, I have no idea what's going on. It becomes very hard to reason about the system. And before you know it, you go and create a distributed trace solution. Now, nice thing about the distributed tracing solution is that nothing really works. There is anyone that actually does work. There is one by Twitter that does sampling only if you're working with a Twitter internal, uh, Finagel, Twitter internal uh, system. There is one only on Google Cloud. But is there anyone that is generally available that actually works and scalable and can give you an insight into each request that goes on in, on your, in your system? So that becomes a problem. And remember, we try to decouple things, things change. You can't draw a diagram anymore. First of all, there's no way to draw a diagram with 200 boxes, and there's no way to draw the interactions between 200 boxes. So what's your architecture? And your rate of change, of course, increases, because that's the idea. That's what you wanted to do. We wanted the couple things to allow deployment and fast deployment. Today, at Wix, we have three deployments at any given time in parallel. Three, the average is three different microservices being deployed at any given time, which means that at any given time, we have a mix of eight different versions of our system running in parallel. Because for each of the microservices, we have at least two versions running. Multiply that, we have eight different versions running of our system at the same time. So one request might go to the system and work. Second request might go to the system get and work, but be much slower. And third one, one might go to the system and fail. And all of those three basically worked in three different systems because those three different software versions. So that's, again, another downside of microservices. And at the end, I think you need to ask yourself, when you go back to what we started with and we started with what we're talking about, we were doing microservices in order to scale our engineering, in order to scale our system, both people-wise and instance-wise. Is it worth it? And my claim, and I think today that it is, probably should have a slide here, yes, but uh, for us it's working. But you, did, you do need to take care of the downsides of microservices. 